All right, I'm here with Caitlin, and we have two train wrecks to talk about today. The first one being, I think, the big one, FTX, has gone bankrupt, announced about 12 or 20 minutes ago. It is the third largest cryptocurrency exchange. It's uh, incorporated in the Bahamas to escape United States regulation, like Binance, which is also overseas, the number one. Uh, a few days ago, CZ at Binance basically called in Alone, he decided to sell all his tokens from FTX for $2 billion, which was enough to cause a collapse. And then he considered buying it to save them. But when he looked at their books, he found out their situation was far worse than expected because they had transferred $8 billion to prop up another exchange by the same founder, Sam Bankman Freed, called Alameda. And that money was all lost. So he said, uh, there's no hope of saving these people and he's not going to buy them. And they have declared bankruptcy, and Sam Bankman Feed has resigned. Now, he apparently faces uh, financial investigations, uh, although I'm not sure what jurisdiction, perhaps the Bahamas. The Bahamas have frozen his assets, have frozen the FTX assets. So it, it uh, I'm sure there will be tons of legal cases coming out of this, and there will be collateral damage. So far, Coinbase has claimed that they do not have much exposure here. So perhaps Coinbase will survive, which is very important because Coinbase is the most important American exchange. And Tether has not lost its peg yet, but people are concerned that both of those things would happen. And that would be an even more catastrophic collapse of the crypto space. Anyway, one thing that's amazing is one of my friends sent me an article, uh, a, a video interviewing Sam Bankman Freed from April. Um, thank you on the Bloomberg podcast odd lot. And they talked to him about how is it people make money in crypto? And he admits openly that it's just a Ponzi scheme. He asked him to explain yield farming. He said, here's how it goes. I give you, I pop up a box and you put some money in the box. Then I issue a bunch of tokens and I start giving airdrops of these tokens to the people who put money in the box. And then people start buying the tokens. Now the tokens have no value, but of course, people will start buying them saying, oh, here's a new crypto. Maybe it will go up. Let's just buy some of that. So it doesn't gain some value. So now people are getting interest in putting money in the box. So people just put more money in and getting more tokens. And that's how it works. And he said, that's incredibly cynical. There's no actual value anywhere. That's just a Ponzi scheme. And he said, well, yeah, yeah. But so is pretty much all investing these days, which is the argument I hear from crypto bros a lot, which I'm afraid I cannot refute which is that the so-called legitimate investment is pretty much all Ponzi schemes anyway, like, for example, Tesla. Tesla actually does sell cars, but it sells at a price 10 times what the cars are worth for no apparent reason. People just keep pouring in more money because they just keep believing it will go up. And as long as uh, Elon stays in the headlines, this will work. So you're just dancing on air. And it's, uh, it's more like show business, where it's just a matter of staying popular than it is like actual legitimate old-fashioned business where you actually do something that produces something of value and you trade it to people for money and that's how you make money so anyway um that's the big disaster going on and now i think we can go on to the second train wreck which caitlin is going to start yeah so there are in the media uh and in social media as well a lot of prominent figures Attract racists by using dog whistle language. That would be Trump. Like Trump, for example, but also Elon Musk. Yeah. And a lot of people sort of ignore it. They don't think it's that big of a deal. But I can assure you, all the racists pick up on it and they know about it. And how do I know this? Well, uh, the Associated Press has an article by David Klepper talking about how Racial, racial tweets and insensitive and bigoted tweets have soared, absolutely soared, since Musk took over Twitter. Like, they got the message. They all got the message. Uh, so, in particular, uh, the article talks about researchers at the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Uh, they looked at various racial and ethnic and bigoted slurs, slurs that were happening on Twitter since Musk bought it. And... Uh, attacks against uh, black people were 20, uh, uh, three times the average for 2022, so 300% increase. Uh, trans um, slurs increased 53%, and homosexual, you know, uh, slurs towards homosexual men went up almost 40%. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, there's also been a bunch of increased uh, hate language towards Jews and Hispanics. So yeah, the the bigots, they, they hear it, they get it, and they act on it. And that's why, you know, you, no one should be putting up with any sort of, you know, dog whistly language. It's not okay. It is is just as bad as if the politician came out and said, you know, it's okay to use slurs. It's It's not. Well, I don't even think there's a dog whistle. I mean, the head of the G the GOP uh, Senate committee issued a tweet saying, Elon, Kanye, Trump. Those are our guys. That tweet is still up. Yep. And uh, the first thing Musk did was spread homophobic slurs about Nancy Pelosi's husband. And he, and he said free speech was to bring back in the alt-right. So I think there's not even been a dog whistle in this case. He just made it very clear that was his goal. I, well, it, it's a dog whistle in that, you know, he said, you know, free speech. Free speech is a huge yeah. dog whistle for, you know, yeah. free speech hate is speech. a euphemism for Nazis. Yeah. For for hate speech. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone is for, for free speech. We all like free speech. Uh, it's important to know that Twitter's not the government. It does not regulate free speech. <laughs> when they're talking about free speech on Twitter, they're talking about people being able to use hate speech. And they, the users on Twitter, figured that out and knew exactly what he was talking about. This isn't some secret. This isn't some, oops, I didn't mean to, you know, encourage the hateful people. No, this was intentful. Yeah. Of course, this reminds me of an article long ago in the before times, like 10 years ago, where they said, you know, there's no, no one on earth that actually wants free speech. And if you think Ameris was for free speech, try putting up a copy of an MP3. I mean, everybody has something they block and they just argue about what to block. Well, the idea behind free speech is that the government is not supposed to limit what you can say. But they do. There's always, there's in every nation, there's a bunch of things you can't say. In America, it's the only things you can't say are things that would put people in physical harm or violate their rights in uh, other no, ways. No, you can't put up a copy of an MP3 on your website. It's pirated. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no. that's copyright infringement, not free speech. You, well, that's that's the part because money is what's sacred in America. Well, in other true. countries, it's like you can't insult the king because that's what they regard as sacred, but they don't care about pirating MP3. Okay. Anyway. Fair enough. Yeah. And and so I've been following the Twitter thing too, of course. It's unbelievable. And that caught my attention because they hit my alma mater, the FTC. Twitter had a data breach. They run an FTC um, court order since I think 2011, and another one renewed this year for sloppy handling of data. And they are therefore required, among other things, not to roll out any new products without having a security audit first. But Musk has fired not only the security team, but he's also been rolling out products without that auditing. And this requires someone at Twitter must sign a document claiming that these products have gone through a security audit, and they haven't. And the content moderation team has quit because they tried to make them sign this. And there was a guy named Roth who was one of the big wigs retained at Twitter. He was the one that retained any credibility. And he just resigned yesterday because apparently he knew that he would personally be risking legal exposure by signing the document saying that these products had undergone the audit, which they have not undergone, which is very much like what happened to the latest round of Trump lawyers. The, uh, they were tricked into this one was tricked into signing a document saying that they had handed over all the classified documents when they knew they hadn't. And so uh, and then Musk had his first meeting. He called an all hands meeting. He gave people only like 20 minutes notice and then he showed up 15 minutes late. And then he rambled for an hour with very Trumpian statements. But he said Twitter might go bankrupt. So this is uh, when I came home late last night after teaching, I noticed all my friends are totally abandoning Twitter. We're going to Mastodon. This place is burning down. It may not be here by the morning. And I see why they're saying it. I mean, he doesn't say it's going to go bankrupt that fast, but he does say we have to do crazy things to make a pile of money immediately or we'll go bankrupt. And all of his crazy stuff so far and it is very disturbing. And uh, apparently they're facing, they're taking, they're risking huge punishments from the FTC by just blatantly ignoring the court order, which is what Trump uh, Musk has always done. He's always just ignored all the laws, ignored the Securities and Exchange Commission, just blast right through the stop signs everywhere he goes, and he's doing it again. And uh, maybe, just like we're saying about Trump, maybe he won't get away with it this time, but he always got away with it before. So we'll see. But the one thing I think he can't do is magically get a billion dollars a year out of Twitter, which is what he needs. I think that's just... Uh, 
wishful thinking. He is planning to turn it into PayPal, which is just recycling his old idea that worked. But I really don't understand how Twitter turning to PayPal is suddenly going to make a pile of money. when since there already is PayPal. So I think, uh, I think we're seeing the collapse of, of, of hubris. If somebody just thinks they can make money out of nothing, being humiliated and demonstrating that they can't make money out of nothing. But we'll see. He still has the PayPal mafia, the whole gang of people that worship him anywhere he goes, and maybe they'll continue to hold him up. But uh, it doesn't look like it. Anyway, um, another one is GitHub's Copilot. I've heard this more and more. People say Copilot is great. You have to pay some money. And then it will suggest code to you when you're coding. It'll say, hey, add this code. This code looks good. Sort of like Clippy. Looks like you're writing a program. Let me suggest some lines of code. And apparently they're pretty good code, but unfortunately they're too good. Open source developers have said, I find it suggesting just the page of code that I wrote. So what they did was they trained an AI on all these open source projects. And the open source is just repeating verbatim what it learned, the AI is, and therefore the, uh, they're being sued saying all the code created with GitHub Copilot should therefore be treated as open source. Since you did just copy it from open source code and the fact that you passed it through a so-called AI doesn't change the fact that you've just copied open source code. That seems like a pretty good argument and that seems like no corporate user can actually use it. And it raises the specter that all the code you write with this tool, you might get sued for later and required to uh, open source it and abandon the profits you're making from it. So we'll see what comes to that. But that seems like a really strong blow against it. Anyway, uh, let's go back to you. You've got more delightful news. Everybody getting fired. Yeah. So we all know that once Musk took over Twitter, they had huge layoffs. Lots of people no longer employed at Twitter. They're all looking for new jobs. Well, it turns out that Twitter was just the beginning. So the Financial Times has an article written by Richard Waters um, talking about the other layer layoffs that are going on right now. So there's, of course, all the stuff going on at, at Twitter, uh, but Meta is also at the same time uh, killing off a bunch of their jobs. Um, and That's a much bigger amount of people. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So yeah, Twitter lost 3,700 jobs, according to the article. And uh, Meta said it was uh, getting rid of 11,000 jobs. Um, so, uh, but other companies are doing the same. So there's Stripe, which is laying off a bunch of people as well. Um, and uh, Amazon, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, they're all uh, basic. Well, I know at least a Amazon um, is also laying off people from their devices sector. Apparently people are buying Alexas and using it for very basic things like Alexa, turn on the lights um, or Alexa. Oh, I didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's, uh, I may have been doing some stuff with the device earlier, but anyway, um, you know, they, they use it for very basic things. And so Amazon's like, why are we putting all these features into Alexa that no one's actually using? So, uh, Amazon is, um, you know, firing a bunch of people. They've fired a bunch of the roboticists. I mean, just everyone's just having all these layoffs. And apparently it has to do with the fact that during the pandemic, a lot of these businesses soared uh, and they thought it would continue through like 2023. But as the pandemic is sort of winding down, things are going back to normal. Um, and, you know, the market is sort of correcting itself. And I guess Elon was the catalyst to start all this. But a lot of people right now are just losing their jobs left and right. Yeah, therefore, the job market is flooded with experienced coders. Um, yeah, they're going get, to get sucked up by startups. And those startups are going to have a huge advantage. And they're going to make those big companies run for their money. This is something I've heard from several sources is that the most profitable, most successful companies are formed during bad economic times like this because you can hire good people and you also develop good habits of not wasting money. So you, uh, the, one, the ones formed during boom, town, boom times tend to be sort of sloppy and wasteful and collapse, which does make sense. Yeah, so hopefully the, the laid off people uh, will get a chance to get into something good. Hopefully they've saved some of their money and not spent it all. That's that's the important right. thing when you're in this high tech private sector. You you get you're flying high and then suddenly your company is gone. So you can't get used to that. Nope. 
anyway, um, I did find something pretty interesting. They have a sand battery. You know, one big problem with um, uh, renewable power is it only happens at certain times, like when the wind is blowing or when the sun is out, and you have to store the energy. And I had never heard of this before. They have a sand battery, which is a giant silo-shaped container. They fill it with sand, and they heat it to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the temperature is what stores the power. And they claim this is cheap, it, uh, in, uh, doesn't waste anything, and a good way to store power. I'd never heard of this. I've heard of other ones where you just pump water up into a tank or you lift a heavy rock. But apparently storing it in the heat in sand, which is actually heating the air in the sand, is what they claim is a very efficient way to store it. And it stores a lot of energy, um, uh, enough to heat like hundreds of homes yeah enough enough heating and power for 100 homes so it's uh it sounds pretty good and this would be a certainly much better thing to have rather than the sort of uh, energy generating plants we have now spitting with smokestacks if you just had a wind farm or something connected to a silo full of sand that seems a whole lot more uh environmentally friendly so i was interested in that and that's an article from the bbc and you've got a quantum computer But I think you're on mute. I was on mute. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So yeah, Ars Technica has a, a, a article uh, from John Timmer, written by John Timmer, talking about new computers, new quantum computers with 400 qubits, over 400 qubits. Like it's only like 433 qubits, which is a lot of qubits. I remember when they were like, "We have eight qubits. We have 16 qubits." Uh, now they have 433. And I thought by now, now that we have like 433 qubits, we'd be breaking encryption and doing all this cool stuff, but we are not. Amen. We are absolutely not. We're still far away. We still need more qubits. And the big problem with this computer is that it's not stable. So you put in your uh, you know, quantum program and you know, a couple of times you get the right answer. <laughs> Sometimes, maybe. Uh, so there's still a long way to go, but, you know, increasing the number of qubits is, is a huge, you know, milestone, uh, towards, towards what IBM is, is working towards, which is they have this entire development roadmap that they're, uh, working from, uh, and eventually they do want, you know, fully usable, you know, quantum computers by the end of the decade, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the problem is, as it always has been, uh, noise, qubit quality and the connection right. quality. Um, we need to overcome that, although there was a, a development about three months ago where they developed quantum error correction to try mm -hmm. to deal with the noise. So, you know, all the it's very exciting. I and mean, I think definitely in 10 or 20 years, we'll have quantum computers that can really do things like blow through RSA. But the current ones are all just prototypes developing a technology. Right. But we're getting closer. That's the important yes. thing. Yes. And some of them can actually do some useful things like the ones that use uh, quantum annealing instead of the uh, algorithmic types. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Tuesday.